Hey, hey, how are you, true believers? Welcome to issue 21 of the warm up uh, with my special guest, Margaret Stoll. So, before we get started today, uh, there's something I'd like to talk to you guys about. Um, it's been about three weeks since we last got together. And with everything that's happening in our country and around the world, I want to share my thoughts with you and the reasons why. Uh, if you've watched previous episodes of the warm-up, you've, you've heard me say that I created this show to be a happy distraction for you guys, Marvel fans, comic fans, anyone sitting at home during this deadly pandemic, simply waiting to return to a sense of normalcy. And yeah, it's also been created to as much of a distraction for, for me as for you. But after the horrific death of George Floyd, and the events that started to unfold in its aftermath, doing this show, it didn't feel right. I, I realized <clears throat> I didn't want to be a distraction, even a minor one, during a time when none of us should be distracted from what's happening in our world. The racism and violence we're seeing against, against black and brown communities has been happening for decades, centuries, it's an old history, but it's now, especially now, and always the responsibility of each and every one of us to face this history, acknowledge it, learn from it, and stand together to speak out. Stanley often wrote of this and, and Marvel's feelings about racism and bigotry. In 1968, he said the only way to destroy these things is to expose them to reveal them for the insidious evils they really are. His words, they ring as true today as they did then, but it saddens me, and I wonder what Stan would think if he knew that we still had to be repeating them with the same fervor that he did 52 years ago. Like Stan, I and everyone at Marvel have always known that this is the only way forward, the only way. That's why we stand with our fellow black employees, storytellers, creators, and the entire black community. We stand, as we always have, for inclusion and love. Here on the warm-up, I'm going to continue to talk about comics and creativity as I always have. And I'm gonna to continue to talk about love, how much I love all of you out there. Look, I know we're going through rough times now, and at times it can feel pretty bleak. So let me leave you with a question that Stan actually asked us all decades ago. The power of love and the power of hate. Which is the most enduring? When you tend to despair, let that answer sustain you. Let it sustain you, me, let it sustain us all. Love you guys and thank you for indulging me. Now, let's get on with, the, with this silly show. Um, our, our first guest, uh, if you don't know, is, is an amazing talent, author, world builder, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and, and surprisingly, a great friend. She slums it. It's Margaret Stoll, or Margie, Margie, as everyone at Marvel calls her. We can't figure it out. She'll let us know which is right. I say Margie. Um, but before bringing her on, before bringing her on, I, I have... I have some disappointing news. Um, I'm bringing on a co-host. And look, it's not my choice, right? He, he was a co-host uh, for Paul Shear's show. And, you know, he's, 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 on the, he's on salary and they're looking for stuff for him to do. So I said, hey, would you take him on? I'm like, look, only if he listens and, and, and he learns uh, will I bring him on. Uh, another person, now I'm on the other side of this, a person that unfortunately is my friend. Uh, let, me, let me bring on my buddy, Steve Wacker. Steve, how are you? Welcome. Welcome thanks, to- uh, Thanks for the great introduction, Joe. You're welcome, Steve. <laughs> that was uh, nothing like sent you. You know, it, it, it's, I don't need any more help dragging the show down, but I'm, uh, you know, but, but they decided to, to, to sidle me with you. So, so here we are. I gave you a 35 page document about me to read and you didn't read a word of it. No, not, not a word, not a word of it. But look, enough about you, all right? Let's talk about our guest, right? Let's, should we bring her on? Should we bring, should we bring her on? What do you say? Absolutely. Do you call her Margie or Margie? Which way do you go? I go Margie. I go Margie. So we'll fight this out later. All right, let's bring her on. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Miss Margaret Stoll. Margaret, how are you? There she is. Hi, Joe. How's hi, it going? Steve. Hello, Margie. <laughs> I love that. I love that. It was, hi, Joe. Hi, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> See, let me just excerpt this 35-page document. I'll, I, I'll just quote from you the whole time. That's great. If you don't mind reading it as part of a post-show thing, we can add it on to this uh, clip. I'd appreciate it. Brilliant points, and I can tweet the rest. It, it will last me the next 35 years. You can see the bullet points we worked on behind Margie. Yeah. Like those yeah. were outlined. Mar I think Margie. Yeah, she's, she looks like she's trying to solve the world's ills. This is crazy. You know, it's it's uh, it's, it's mad scientist stuff. It's my, it's my beautiful mind's uh, whiteboard walls room. It's, That's it's awesome. the room where it happens, Joe. You know, there's well, a little yeah, madness. Let's, let's let everybody see it. Let's say, oh, there it is in full. There we go. Look at that. That's yeah. awesome. So, so, I so, so Margie, you know, be, be, before we before we dig into like your your, your history and your your secret origin. Um, you know, you, you and I actually are, we're involved in a project that people will be seeing. Uh, uh, what do you think, Steve? You know this, right? The, the launch date for this thing will be sometime in uh, July? It's going to be, uh, I, I don't think I can say the actual date, but it's it's within the next few weeks. Oh, Ooh. that's true. Okay. How about that? So so people can catch that. We can't talk about it. It's very, it's very secretive. So, um, but but one of the things I wanted to, to mention is that you you and I first met at one of the big Marvel writing summits, writer summits, you know, creative summits, and I was so taken aback because again, when when new people come in, um, there they you know two things happen with new with, with either young creators or creators who've never been in that kind of a that big a room, right? Either they are intimidated to talk, right? And, 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 you, and you want to encourage them to come out of their shell and like, like you know, it's okay, contribute. There's no bad ideas, right? Um, or there are those that just, you know, like over contributing, like just, and it, but it's all out of nervousness. But you just sort of jumped into the flow as though you had been doing it for so long. And, and the only thing I could attribute that to was, you know, your, your longstanding career in video games and also co-writing a lot of things. You've been in rooms yeah. like that probably longer than I have. Um, is that is that how it felt to you? I mean, was it just sort of like, oh, this is a room. I kind of do this thing. You know, um, thank you for saying that. Partly, uh, I like to, I love to collaborate. I've talked about this a bit. I, it's one of the things I love about comics. I'm seeing that right now in particular um, on Spider-Man Noir which I'm sure we'll get to with Juan Freya, who's just a, a phenomenal artist. But, um, and I, and I learned a lot of that. One of my first lessons about that, Joe, is from you collaborating with you on life of Captain Marvel. When you really in the editorial process, you and Senna, you would be like, stop, pause, pull back. This is like, this is a moment for the artist to tell the story. And that truly is what I'm always looking for, which is learning and working with people who are better than I am even. And and I want a jam session where I can get to a place I couldn't get on my own. Mm -hmm. And that spirit is always really present in those Marvel Creative Summits where people are jamming and they're trying to get somewhere collectively together. And I just love that. I love different brains, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, that that that's always the, the the fun of it, the fun of it for me. Um, unfortunately, Steve is in that room too, and you you know what that's like. Whew, what a bear! Uh, <laughs> so, Margie, that, now you grew up in California, uh, but you used to spend your summers in in Richfield, Utah, um, okay. and and uh, tell us a little bit about that because that that also became the the setting really for the, the the thing that kind of really brought your name into the mainstream right which is you know the Castro Chronicles and you know beautiful creatures there it is hey, you, you don't have to work that hard look I got I've got it right here you know? <laughs> um, yes I uh, I was writing about my grandmothers and mothers and grandfather's town in Southern Utah. My writing partner, Cami Garcia, was from the equivalent small town in North Carolina, Pilesville, I believe. And between us, we realized there's the great uh, casserole belt, the cream of country that exists and kind of spread from Southwest, you know, the sort of rural communities and the rural South. 
And so that was really fun. But I, uh, I like to write about those sort of fishbowl communities where everyone is watching everyone um, and is in everyone's business. And you, you love and hate the place and the people you're from. And that's kind of what I'm always working out. So, wow. so, yeah. and so tell us about the, I mean, you and I talk about this, you know, a bit in, 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 uh, in other places, but um, I know your mom was really, really instrumental in uh in you your creativity your outlook on life um you mind talking about her just a little bit because i i i just i i always love how uh when we dig deep how how our parents either you know launch us in one direction or another and, and what it takes to do that well really joe remember in that uh captain marvel and steve you were there too when we broke out uh life of captain marvel in that story summit um it was, uh, we just were like putting all our family, I was going to say junk on the table, but that didn't yeah. quite seem right. But uh, we, we just like put it out there and that's really like the stuff that, uh, the relatable stuff that everyone has in common is sort of those, the like, the frailties and the strengths you get from those relationships, right? We talked about that, the, the origin story for a, for, for a human is a family story, right? Mm. And so for a superhuman is, is still sort of a super family story. So um, for me, a lot of it comes from that. My mom has been sick. She has multiple sclerosis. So that's been um, a thing that I've been sort of working with and around since I was 12. And um, that was a really like a shaping thing for me. But my mom also is a really strong personality. And my love of reading comes from her going and tracking down books for me. I wrote about this actually uh, for Marvel not too long ago from an independent bookstore by my house uh, in near UCLA and uh, and just sort of reading to us in the car. And and so my voice and a lot of my sort of vulnerabilities come from my mother, which is an interesting thing. You can see that in Life of Captain Marvel. I'm really working out um, like what is the relationship between Carol Danvers being super strong and you know and sort of the the female role models in her life yeah i remember it, there being so much family uh family uh carol's family was like a gordian knot of continuity and complication and i remember in that i, I think it was we were in there for a day or two just trying to unwind like where that brother had been where the dad had been was the dad yeah. alive and mm -hmm. Um, and so finally deciding to hook the whole story around, you know, make, making that problem, the actual st story, uh, yeah. sort of what key to And then so many of the great Marvel stories just come from fam, fam, family stories. The core of all of our great characters has something to do with family, whether it's Aunt May, whether it's the Fantastic Four as a group. Yeah. Uh, so it was, it was very cool to bring that to Carol. Well, yeah, that was, found that was, yeah. Go ahead, Mark. No, I'm saying found family and family. That's Marvel, you know. Those are, Avengers are a found family. Like we're always re we're replicating that structure always. <laughs> yeah, we're sort it, of family. It, Three of us. We've got Grandpa and the two <laughs> young kids. I thought of us as the triplets. Okay, so just go with that. No, no, no. Joe's much older than us. Yeah. Oh. You know how easy it would be. For me? I, I could just with the with the button. I could just eliminate Steve. We'd never <laughs> see him again. Uh, <laughs> so. But you know the, the, those those Captain Marvel Life Captain Marvel sessions were so much. I mean, they they were they were tough, but they were really a lot of fun because the tough part was figuring out the jigsaw puzzle, right? Because there was this very convoluted history with the character. So how do we and and and, and as Steve knows, when we when we do this with a lot of our characters, we try to revamp or clean up an origin so that it's you know so that when it, for lack of a better way of saying it, it's a cliche way of saying it, but the elevator pitch, right? Like. If someone back then, if someone to ask you about the elevator pitch with who's Carol Danvers, you, boy, you'd have to go into some serious continuity to, to to tell them exactly how she got to where she was. So we had to figure out how do we streamline it so that if someone asks us, "What's the elevator?" It's like boom, here it is. Here's she, who she is. Here's how she got her powers. Um, so we and but at the same time, we didn't want to discount 
all those comics that people have read because that's kind of a it, it feels like a, like a cheat so you want to make sure those comics still count but now you could read them in a different way uh and i think we really achieved that and then then the fun part was when so that was a jigsaw part jigsaw puzzle part then the fun part was you know interjecting you know there was a little bit of my family a little bit of my wife's family a little bit of margie's family a little bit of steve's family we were all just like throwing in and we created this family unit and 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 i think the the part that I, I really start I really dug that 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 I didn't see until you actually wrote the book was the town when you started writing about the, t- the town Margie that's when I'm like oh this is a whole other dimension that we didn't discuss in the room and that's the stuff I think that even more personal stuff that you interjected because I felt like I was there in that town in Maine yes uh, I did love getting everyone's family. Uh, like they're everyone's sort of the clay of everyone's family. That was exactly the jam session thing I love. And Joe, that's really when when I loved you the most was like that was when but that was when everyone in the room became a human. And I and I've talked I actually talked about true. Steve's got a just gonna alert that one over. No, but I talked to a TV writer about this who said we're talking about like can you hear our crazy birds going outside my window? The, um, talking about like when people actually bring their like humanness into a writing room, a writer's room, and like when you start making meaningful stories is when like people hear each other as humans and see each other as humans and like allow that that sort of personal storytelling in. And I know for me that's where like the good stuff always always comes from because then I'll feel passionately and I will do a better job. But I said this to you before, Joe, like that, those two days, breaking out that story, that conversation about all of our families in that writer's room for Carol Danvers, that was, um, that was really like the first time that I understood that the, the creative product was a conversation. Yeah. Like the powerful thing was the conversation. And when we left there, I remember you saying this to me. You were like, this is it. Like, this is special. Like, we got it. And um, it's the first time that's ever happened. I, I'm not sure it's even happened. It's probably happened since then, but I don't know that it has in that powerful of a way where, like, yeah. where, like the, the thing happened in the room. Yeah. And I just had to write it after that. Yeah. No, she, like, she, <laughs> suddenly, suddenly she had, you know, she was, she was living and breathing for all of us. We're like, okay. You know, now that's the matter whether people like the story, and and, and it was really, really, really well received. Um, so, so Mar, again, in terms of your secret origins, do you remember um, the moment, a spark, where you know, I'm sure you know, you were you were an avid reader, but where was there a point where you said, "This is what I want to do"? Oh, for sure. Um... For me, uh, well, I was really shy. I didn't, which I know you'll find hard to believe. I didn't talk to anyone outside my family until about third grade, and I just read books all the time. And I went to a special school, like a lab school, um, where we just you, we just had to do what you scheduled that you were going to do. They were sort of experimenting on us. It was it was a gifted school back when we sort of designated kids into boxes, more like that, and. Um, I just scheduled reading room the whole time. In fact, I learned my multiplication tables on the yard in sixth grade out of shame, like from a friend. But uh, I just read books. And um, I started, like Narnia was an early influence. For me, Hope was always a fantasy book. It was about escape. And um, But the book that created me really as a writer was, it's not famous. It's called, it's a series called The Dark is Rising from a British author named Susan Cooper. And um, and that's really, I think, the only person I've fangirled in my life to that extent where someone uh, gave me a signed book from her and later I got a signed letter, like a letter she wrote me and I just started bawling like hysterically. But that was, you know, that was about a, you know, that was a, a high fantasy, you know, nerdly British, you know, traditional, J.K. Rowling before J.K. Rowling. And Joe, you should always learn the nerdy poem from the front of your fantasy book, which I did because I was the head of the Darkest Rising fan club. So that was my start. <laughs> it was, that was my jam. And since then, I've just sort of been building magical worlds. 
Um, and because my first, I sold some screenplays, but really my first extended creative job was in video games, I actually really learned to build worlds in 3D, which is a different thing, you know, entirely sort of weird a weird side of my career. But yeah, I've been like basically a, a fantasy or science fiction world builder with a real emphasis in uh, like emotional human stories for 30 years. I mean, for three years, I'm not that old. <laughs> so um, how did you meet, uh, how did, I'm sorry, Joe. No, go ahead. I'm just curious, what, what led to you meeting the, the writer of Darkest Rising? Oh, uh, Susan Cooper. Uh, I, with a friend of mine, another form of collaboration, I uh, co-founded the two biggest teen and youth uh, literacy nonprofit, you know, book festivals in um, the U.S., uh, Y'all Fest in, in Charleston and Y'all West in Santa Monica. And uh, unbeknownst to me, my partner in crime, Melissa De La Cruz, who actually I wrote my, uh, yeah, good, Joe, you have it all. Uh, last book with. Thank you. Uh, she wanted to surprise me because she knew I'd flip out. So she invited her and uh, Susan Cooper couldn't make it, but sent sent a lovely letter, which I have and, you know, take out and smell the envelope and study the writing so often. And uh, it was, yeah. But also I think about that all the time uh, regarding the internet. Like, Joe, people can come find you at a con or talk to you, not you know, now. <laughs> not now, but reach out to you, you know, on Twitter yeah. or whatever, look for you. And like, I, my brain would have with the Susan Cooper at that point in my life. So that's always, an, it's interesting, you know, how, how much I think about young creators and the impact of the accessibility in a certain way of, and, of the creators you respect. And, does, and doesn't that doesn't that also affect like you know you're on social as well doesn't that affect how you approach young creators and people on social right because you, you you know you wanted that experience and you had it in a way but uh, but you think about why well, if, if I had Twitter if I had you know I, I could have probably reached out and gotten a response I, I know that I do you know that 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 when people reach out to me I try as often as possible to to, to, to give some sort of response uh, do you feel a responsibility in that way as well I do I. I'm deeply interested in um, the the more than half of the world that's 20 and under. I mean, Beautiful Creatures was published in 50 countries. I spent more time touring since 2008, seeing students. I've been to a million schools outside of the United States. I, I mean, I've spent more time on book tours outside the United States than in it, actually. And sort of my my worldwide thinking about you know what it is to be, you know to be that age, I have so much respect and um, they're just, they're better than we are in basically every way. And so I, uh, I wanna take those interactions really seriously. And that's mostly just because those are the people I like the most also, but, but really they're the best people. I mean, you see a lot of that lately with the activism yeah. and the sort of self-responsibility about their own thinking and holding their parents accountable and and their cities it's it's super no matter what your politics are it's super inspiring the sort of the sort of the moral moral of, of their generation generation determinism like we are going to impact this do yeah. you think yeah yeah it, it, it's yeah. It, 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 uh, hmm. it sounds like your child is such a you know is is there such a role we've talked about it in your life right like the, these are these are shaping and steve I, I know the same as with sort of that generation for you and your own family like these people the this tide of, of sort of young brains really impacts us or i want them to they i think they do yeah I, yeah I, 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 i'm sorry guys I'm, I'm echoing are you guys hearing me echo or no? No, no. Oh, good. We were a little bit before, but I think you're okay yeah. now. Um, yeah, no, listen, I, I gain inspiration from, from my daughter, <clears throat> pardon me, um, all the time. And, and you know, 2020 has been an insane year. There's no question about it. And, you know, some people just kind of want to want it to go away to be over with. And, and I was telling her the other day, 
that in a lot of ways, 2020, especially for her generation, as tough as this has been, this could be the greatest year in the sense of they, they're they having to experience things that other generations just have not, right? The, the, the whole isolation thing, you know, social distancing thing, the, the, the protests, the marches, the kneelings, the, the activism that's going on right now. It, it, in a lot of ways, this, this, we could be looking at, you know, uh, another, the formation of another greatest generation because they're going through, you know, some stuff now. I didn't have to go through this. I'm sure you guys didn't have, you know, we, we had our own things, but, um, but it, but this, I think this is, this is the kind of thing that, that, uh, develops a certain, a certain, uh, thickness of skin and tough, toughness and, and, uh, um, and, and fight that, that will, will see manifest itself years from now, you know, probably, you know, sooner than we actually think. Um, and, and with beautiful creatures, I mean, Margie, but with me, this, what is it? It's published in 39 countries now translated in 28 languages. So you're speaking to a tremendous... It's 39 characters, we're actually in 50 countries. It's crazy. Oh, wow, it's 50. Because wow. like... Okay. Yeah. My numbers are wrong. But yeah. I mean, that... It that's... just went up while we were talking. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. Marge, does do you feel like... Does that, does that add to the weight of responsibility when you're talking to young, especially young readers who are, who are just loving your book or just picking it up for the first time, right? I mean... Uh, or, or maybe seeing seeing the movie. Um, it, it, do you feel the weight of that? In a bunch of different media. So, what I actually think of as my primary role is is world building. I think about that more than like thinking of myself as a writer, mm -hmm. and. What my focus is kind of what it's what I call foundational IP. It's like worlds that then are expressed, you know, in a book or in streaming content or in a video game or a comic or a podcast. And um, so I think sort of world first, but um, and then in all those different expressions, I have different uh, responsibilities because I have different fans. I have different, you know, my readers aren't exactly the same as my uh, books, as my comics readers aren't exactly the same as my game. You know, people who are impacted by my digital comics for for a game like Destiny or for stuff that happens in game or for the incubation, like inventing new games and the sort of early lab thinking I do. So I feel it differently for, for different um, people. And that's interesting when you mean kind of different things um, to different folks, but I do take it really seriously mostly because I want, particularly for young creators, I want them to understand that they have to be the first person to take themselves seriously. So I take them seriously and I, I believe they, they can do it. You know, generally I do. I'm surrounded by so many talented youth. So yeah, that felt like a lot of blah, blah, but you know what I'm kind of saying. No, no, I, I totally get it. I, and, and what I find fascinating is, is you know, as is, is I peruse your history, right? I mean, you, you not only have you been creating at a very young age, but you, you were also, you know, for example, you, right, you, you, you wrote for your high school newspaper uh, and you created a lit you created a literary magazine in college, right? So, so yeah. I, I think it, it was, it was a, a foretelling of not just the fact that you're creative, but you're also creating venues and outlets not just for your own creativity but but for others right and, and so so your fest feels like a like a real natural outcome of that um oh it looks like did we freeze yeah we did wow okay huh oh skype what happened to you hmm. did we lose something Wait. oh hang on something on my end we're all right, so bear with me a second because we're fast. Something is fast forwarding on my end. I think it's going to catch up. Our viewers hopefully are not seeing this, or maybe they are. Who knows? Let's see when we catch I'm up. I'm just seeing um, oh, their okay. lovely faces. I think we're back. Hold on. Hmm. Come on now. Okay, I get regain control this so don't know what we lost what we didn't hopefully it was just on our end um 
But yeah, so, so I was saying that you know you're creating venues and outlets for for not only your creativity, but for others. So uh, and I know, I know we touched a little bit on on you all West. Can, can, can you give me a little more about it? Because I I, I really think uh, you all fest. I'm sorry that then and then you created you all West, which is part two of this. Uh, give our viewers you know a, a real load down on this because I, I I think it's a it's it's a it's a it's a great thing and uh, I will join you. I promise you. <laughs> I'm one of these. Yeah, you're you're going to. I've had Steve. You, you. Uh, I've been to you, four or five of the y'all the y'all list. It, it's terrific, and it's such right, a now now I'm feeling terrible. You should. Um, you should. Although I want to say thank you for not coming because uh, I'm <laughs> sure I would not have been invited. Uh, it is a perfect uh, representation of what Marty does because it is such a it's such a connector sort of event. With 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 readers, or fans, with the creators, everyone's very close cl close in. There's tons of conversations. Um, I, you must do over a hundred panels over the course of a day or two. Um, it, it's just a, it's it's a super cool event, particularly if you love books. Yeah, we try to do. Uh, we have a story makers panel that you've done before. I mean, track, which is sort of we like to do beyond books. We do comics. We do video. We do some video game paneling. We do animation. We do some TV and film stuff, and that's mostly like cosplay. Um, my theory is always you need to go to the channels where you know the communities you care about are, and you need to help them find their way to their most uh, important, powerful stories. So in LA, in particular, which has a um, such a creative community, some of the most important stories aren't necessarily in a book. And that's okay. Like, that's sort of the beauty. I love books. I love getting that many words to play with. But I also, I love comics. I love the way an image tells, like, you know, comics always have sort of three stories going at once. And they're sort of like the, you know, the story in, in your protagonist character's head and the story in the world and the relationship between the images and and sort of the dialogue and the storyline. And I, I love that. I mean, that's a, a much harder thing to get at in different media. And actually video games are kind of closer to that where there's this rising action and sort of compressed, um, you know, VO and longer detailed lore that has to be built out offline. But I really love juggling kind of those different ways of telling stories. So we tried to do this really um, inclusive event uh, in terms of sort of the reading communities and the authors and the kinds of creators we have. And I think that's worked out so far. Our last in-person one got 30,000 uh, people to one day in Santa Monica, but our Y'all Stay Home virtual festival this year got 90,000 people from wow. all around the world. Yeah. So that was really cool. I mean, 90,000 not even viewers, like committed registration, signed up, went to special panels, like, yeah. you know, people who really had to show up. So that was that was fascinating. And we saw it as a tragedy that we couldn't meet in person, but so many of our international fans saw it as like just this huge bonus that they got to go, you know? Yeah. The thing I missed uh, is the snack room, because it, it, it is one of the best collection of candies uh, I've ever seen domestically. Really, Steve? I do take candy very seriously. Yeah, really. As a really. candy connoisseur, it's uh, as as a green room. Of... Steve's a green room connoisseur. He yeah. he, uh, he a actually green... has a blog. He's not... ready, I didn't the green rates. room, but <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, I've been to those creative summits. I'd say you guys could work a little harder on some of the uh, green room amenities. <laughs> the, uh, there is the one sandwich kind, and there is the <laughs> no. There are the have... empanadas. Those are good. You don't know this, but Joe makes all those sandwiches the night before. Thanks. I want to get back a little bit to something uh, related to world building. Um, by... You understand the Marvel Universe to did you feel like you had because I think a lot of people come in from the outside and feel like oh crap if I don't know all of it I can't do any of it 
I don't think I don't think we feel that way, but I know that's a challenge that people coming in from the outside sometimes have. Well, I think it's like anything where people assume that everybody else knows everything and that nobody else is as stupid as they are when everybody else is scrambling and has holes and you know everyone has those same fears in a certain way. But uh, yes, my I mean I read I read I'm typical in the sense that I had two brothers and I had access to the comics they had, the action figures they had. I watched, you know, I watched Batman and Superman and Spider-Man. There were some, you know, later. And I, and I, you know, Wonder Woman, obviously. But, um, but my big dunk into Marvel came from when I was a co-founder of an independent game studio called Seven Studios, which is interesting because really I didn't, Ever, I know there are other women who found game studios, game developers. I didn't know any, and um, I actually still don't really. But uh, we did Fantastic Four for Activision, um, which was licensed property, and uh, we did Rise of the Silver Surfer after that. And I worked on Spider Man for the original PlayStation uh, at Activision, so I had had like my deep, and when you do a deep dive like that. My approach has always been the same, and in fact, it was the same when I did. Um, wait for it, Joe. You probably have this one I too. Have with it. The, I have it. You don't, don't save, save, save your strength. It's right there. <laughs> save my strength. Yeah. So what you like when I did these, and these are prose novels actually for Marvel, and this was the first time I started uh, writing for Marvel outside of a game. And uh, I did what I always do, which is sit down. When I worked on Spider-Man, I read every issue of Spider-Man I could find through Venom, because that was the storyline they were doing. And that's like a, I love that, that the like deep dive, the deep cut, you know, like the go all the way in. And um, I did the same thing with with Black Widow. And oh my gosh, that is fascinating. Like if you really look at every Black. The big, the big deep dive because I was always looking for like what is the sort of what it, what is the um, what what can all what can eighty years or sixty years or whatever have in common and it's always something to do with like a a question they're asking a search they're on um, the nature of their heart you know like what their what what propels them their propulsive sort of soul at stake as my friend Jay would say. Um, and that's always generally like one thread you can find and pull on. Or is that like the same for you? Do you guys think that? But because that's really what it, what it seems like for me. And once you find that thread, you have this kind of super confidence where it doesn't matter um, mm. if you get something wrong or, you you know, there's a pocket of some alternate universe storyline you don't, you didn't know or, you know. Yeah. So what, I don't know. go ahead, Steve. You have something? No, just, I was just going to say that I, the, the 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 metaphor I always go back to is that these characters are sort of like pendulums, and they'll they'll swing one way for a while, but in in general they tend to come back to center, it's back to the the core of of how we in, envision. Then they swing out, they'll do something cr crazy for a little bit, they'll go in a direction that no one sees com coming, and it's supposed to. That's what we do. Um, but then over time things come back to center before they swing out again. But you were really interesting. Thank when you. I, you were. That's yeah, exactly you were interesting. I agree. Talking to Senna and you at the beginning of, do you remember that, that Comic-Con we were hanging out and. We were yeah. outside the hotel. Yeah. We we're outside the hotel. Exactly. And I was, I was struggling to find like a, to find like a, a grip on, on Captain Marvel and what her, what her sort of, what that soul at stake line was for her because she's as we've discussed she has the the sort of superman problem of being so powerful and having like so so much ability and like how do you you know what do you how do you limit those things and how do you make that a relatable human story but um but you were the one who really like 
who kept saying, you, you have to tell your story and you're focusing on, you're looking at the wrong place. Like, like you have to do the thing you always do, right? Which is like, which is take, like, take the, find the, find the place where you can, you know, pull on the, the emotional strings that you, you yourself follow. But you had a really, you were the one that sort of had the pivot of the mess is this, is the story. The mess of the story is the story, mm. which was right for her. So I was helpful, Joe. Wait, Steve said that? The mess of the story is the story? Did he say that? Uh, I think she just said it much better than I did. Yeah, because that's really I think, astute. That I can't, I can't, I, I can't imagine those words coming out of Steve's mouth. It's very astute. I think you made that up. The, the writer in you, Margie, made that. Or made you that up. said it, and I blurred you all together. But that, by the way, that is the other thing, which is, um, you know, people break down. Like I am a girl in comics. Aren't that there aren't very many of us, hmm. and. Um, and there are more and more increasingly and independent comics are doing a lot of that good work too. And Marvel and, you know, you guys have been really welcoming and Senna Amanet has done it. Amanet has done a ton of stuff and you guys have been really supportive of that. But, but um, it is really like, it's not that it's not like I go sit in the girl box when we're in our you know, room together. Like, right. And maybe I'm just more comfortable with it because I worked in video games, which is on almost even more male space. But um, I really do see a lot of the guys that I, you know, in the room with me that, and that I met through, through you guys as brothers. And those guys are my friends outside of this and, um, you know, are people who I work with and continue to work with. And so I actually have a big crew that I can ping and say, what do you think about this? Is this stupid? Or like, does that even make sense? Or, you know, so I do have like support. And I think that's really important for any unrepresented group in any industry is like, you need your actual like real allies who are like your partners kind of, who like want you to succeed and, and help you work it out. So that's been really fun because those are meaningful relationships. And because there aren't a million people who do what we all do. And so it's fun because those those guys understand what my life is like in a certain way. So so it's not as clear as like I'm a girl in comics and that makes the men in comics the enemy force for me. And I'm not trying to sound whatever the word, you know, like a collaborator for men or, you know, whatever. It's not a war to me and it's not sides like I, I come from like a, a sibling model with other creators and it's most of the time how I feel and there are always some outliers sure but like that has been pretty much like my experience with you guys is a lot like that like like it feels it does feel like it feels like family and maybe that's just also like what I want my family to feel like you know like creator family but it feels like Thanksgiving or you're like except <laughs> It's not just like funny cousin. Except less delicious. How close have you worked with, uh, with uh, some of the artists you've been working on, working with, excuse me? I'm, uh, well, so uh, I am differently obsessed with a couple of the different artists I've collaborated with. But, um, but uh, I had a really great experience with Carlos Pacheco and Marguerite Sauvage at, uh, when we were working on Life of Captain Marvel and Joe. And, I mean, Joe, this continues to be this and the uh, lighthouse cover you did oh. are just my, I would frame them in my house. They're incredible. I haven't even seen that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. seen cool. This is the, uh, this is the, um, Wait, let me get rid of here, here, this, this way people can see it. There you go. There you go. Now people can see it better. <laughs> Um, thanks, but I, look, um, look. I mean, I I did those. I wasn't even assigned to do those covers. It was just I started to read the the initial, you know, your initial uh, scripts as they came in, and I was just like inspired. So I just handed those in and said, "Hey guys, here, use them or don't use them." But this is sort of the feel that I got from 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 Margie's story, um, and the lighthouse. You know, that that came out of, directly out of your world building. Um, you know, yeah. actually, one of the things I want, because 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 I know we, we you sort of you talk about it, and we we sort of kind of skirted a little bit, but I, I really don't want to don't want to skim through this. Your career, I mean, I'm just going to put some graphics here. This is just 
a small sampling of how many games you worked on in your video game career, uh, nominated for award. I mean, you're 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 so well known in this field, but I think we take it for granted right now um, that you know when you started in this field uh, as a woman in this field, you know, it, it it what was like. I mean, you were doing this for 16 years before you even you know wrote Beautiful Creatures, so. What was it like, you know, sort of getting through the door and 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 working in that world? And, and also, were you a gamer before this? Yeah, I, I mean, I've always been more of like a. I mean, there are more women who play games in the world than men, right? Right. That's a that's the little known and the off sided to each other that you know we women in games say to each other, but like that's a fact. So mm-hmm. like for me. You know, I'm like, I do some, you know, I I, uh, would play some Destiny when I worked on Destiny. I played all the games we made when we were working on them, but I mostly, like, my, the games I live in are more like, you know, my family meets on my island and catches in Animal Crossing and catches falling stars. And, uh, you know, my family are like, I come from a nerd family of collectors, so I was taking my kid to linked Pokemon competitive play at age five when they were touring malls in the beginning, you know, of like multiplayer as a concept. Um, my family went to five Pokemon World Championships so that my oh. ex-husband and my kid could grind in. So I'm more a product of general game nerd culture, but that was a big deal um, at Des- for Destiny in particular, because after all the games, my own studio and a lot of the uh, Command and Conquer and these old school um, military games that I worked on, some of which have been remastered, so that's fun. I'm so <laughs> old that the games I've worked on are coming out for a second time. <laughs> no, it's true. They're hilarious. They're like old, the old FMV, the full motion video, like talking heads from Command and Conquer. I did this one called Red Alert Retaliation that they just remastered and re-released, and it's like some of my favorite, favorite um, you know, mash up, you know, great and horrible game, you know, uh, moments are, are on that, uh, game, that, that, uh, particular re-release. So I was pretty excited about that. Anyway, there have been a lot of, a lot of games in my life. And so, uh, I don't even remember what that question was, but it, a lot of it comes out of that. So, um, and I've worked with a lot of women, uh, now in writer's rooms, uh, at Bungie in particular, but um, oh my gosh, at the beginning, there were not like, the woman's restroom was my office. Like I had all my personal belongings in there. I had a desk. I had like a bookshelf and a desk. That was like, it was just me. And you know, people would say things and I I wouldn't say like what particular developer this was because at the time I was also a contractor before I had a company. And so I've worked with almost everybody, but, by now, I've worked with almost everybody, and at the and or the big guys. And uh, but there's one time I'll never forget walking into this room with like programmers who were my friends, and it was a meeting. I was I was like in charge of the meeting, and I walked in, and someone looked up and said, "Oh, look, the strippers here," because I was the one girl. Like that was what there was. It was just me, and it was I I put up with a lot of stuff that no one would ever be able to do now. Mm-hmm say now yeah but that was it was the wild it was the wildest but 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 i wanted to be in the room and i and for the team dynamic to work and i think this is a thing that women are probably still trying to work out all the time like you know you you need to be able to go to lunch with your team and you need to be able to hang out you need to not be what you know what will feel like a buzzkill and you have to sort of you have to find ways to connect with people who are who are different than you are. And you also have to find ways to say, screw you, I'm not your stripper, you know, you're the stripper, which I eventually was able to do. But like, but so I guess, I guess uh, that was such a wild time because that industry was so young. And um, like one developer I knew didn't hire women because the, the, the founder thought they would be a distraction. Like their work policy was we don't hire women. Like wow. their openly yeah. policy. 
Like that was what it was like 30 years ago, right? So, um, and and everyone, every, at every one of those companies, there were people I loved, like men I loved, boys were my great friends. And, I, you know, and my brother, my ex-husband is still my great friend, our oldest friends, like I work with, like all my closest friends come from games or comics, mm-hmm. um, or now books, but like, like the, the men in my life, of which there are many, are all sort of from that time. So it's, it's so, it's just so weird that I have, I've had so many different kinds of positive, and then like some horror show, but like, but like, you know, different kinds of relationships with, with men in, in those collaborative settings. Yeah. We're always working it out. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 don't uh... even... <laughs> I remember, uh, you, you, you've met my wife, uh, Margie and, and yeah. you know, she, she, uh, uh, I'm not going to talk about where she, she worked. She, she yeah. ran Marvel Knights. She, I mean, Marvel Knights was actually, was actually a company that was run by women. It was, it was, it was my wife, Nancy and, oh, cool. and, and her assistant, uh, Kelly. It wouldn't exist without the two of them. I mean, they, they, they just kept mm-hmm. us going, um, and did everything, all the, all the business, you, you name it, it all funneled through them. Um, but you know, previously she had worked in other places in the comic industry, and and for, for many many years, uh, without naming names, I mean there, there was a thing she would always say to me because I would hear these stories, many of them pretty horrific. Uh, yeah. She said, you know, I, I I love what I do. I hate who I work for, um, but the love of what she was doing and the product she was putting out was so important to her that you know she sort of grinned and bared and stuck through you know as, as things changed um so I, I i think that that's the case you know with a lot of women i think it's the case with a lot of people right if you, if you even if even if you're not a woman you just work for idiots right it's, if you love what you do you kind of stick around uh because you yeah. love it um but i, I yeah, yeah. good sorry no i think that like there are definitely some i hate who you do it for uh, I've had some of those moments in the game in the game industry. Um, I haven't had that in comics in the same way, but I will say that way more, like honestly, the the men, the conversations we have, the jamming, like they could, like you guys could not have been more welcoming. Could not have been more welcoming in terms of the those big, as you were saying, could be intimidating creative meetings. And I never felt I never felt that. And I, and I, I mean, I still see, I see the LA guys, I see, you know, Steve, I see Jerry Dugan, I see Mark Wade, I see Nick Spencer, I see, you know, I see uh, the guys from Marvel Games, like, those are friends, those are my friends, and, and that has been that way from the beginning, you, Joe, like, when my mom was really sick, you flew out to Salt Lake and took me to a concert, you know, when I was living in my parents' house. Like, those are real friends. Yeah. And um, and so that's that's been what that experience has, has by and large been like. But the fandoms can be harder. So that's the one thing that I wish, like, that language could change, where, where like, you like it didn't immediately go if you make like a story decision someone doesn't like that it didn't immediately go to the sort of reddit the reddit language of like you know your body or your you know like who you slept with or if you're ugly or like women do get like immediately put through a different kind of a grinder and it's worse in games and i've had it worse in games yeah yeah yeah, I, I, it, we all see it. We all know it, you know, uh, and, and it's a fortunate outcome of, of, of what it is that, that we do. Um, and you it's know, nightmare, I, right? But I, I hope to look, I, I, I think over time we need to continue to do better. I mean, it's not as great as it is having you in the room. We need more women in the room. We need yeah. more voices of, of, of all kinds, because comics have spent decades being the thing that they are, and we've made huge strides. But I think as as we change, our editorial voices change, our creative voices change. 
I, I think fandom is going to catch up with that kind of thing. Um, and you know how it is, and Joe experiences too. Also, also the angriest voices sound like the loudest ones. Yeah. Um, we have so many great fans every, every day who are supportive, and uh, but just don't cry as loud, loud, loudly about it. Positivity tends to get muted in the social media atmosphere. Yeah. Well, but also you guys, um, you're actually, compared to the game industry, understand because we live in now the world of games as a service. Games are, a game is, is forever changing in direct response to the community. So it's a little, it's, it's, it's harsher there because at some points in the game industry, I would be like, game directors would be sending me, um, you know, Reddit links saying, you know, fix this. And those mm. links would say, you know, a writer who worked for me was, you know, a fat slut and I only had my job from sleeping with so-and-so or, you know what I mean? Like, and I'd be like, no, I, I'm not actually going to read these links, right? Mm. Like, tell me what you want, like filter it, you know, make a decision and tell me, but like, is the chat now directly like directing the game that, you know, like, and you guys are not like that. Like you guys really have, and I think that's an editorial tradition because there's no equivalent of like, there's no editorial responsibility in the game. There's like, a, there's the development team, but like there's no person sort of sitting on the level of like the story and the characters in like specifically with an eye to edit, to sort of say what, what is the sort of cultural product we're producing in a certain way? You think, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm kind of, yeah. you're bouncing off something in my head and I'm just wondering, is there any similarity to sort of the living, breathing Marvel universe and the fact that it's always changing and it's built to change and it's built to adapt, blah, blah, blah. And what you have to deal with in video games, that kind of thing where you're creating, where you have to change things on the fly. I've heard you talk about video building video game worlds and i don't understand half of what you're saying and you go off on some sort of tangent and i get a i get the munchies from a contact guy just talking to you i don't understand any because you're talking in like you're above reality looking in and 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 programming it yeah. uh, like you have your fiction suit on and you're just i do have a fiction suit um but I'm, I'm wondering is that is the marvel universe a different version of that that's really interesting. I mean, yes, uh, because we are in a world of IP as a service, if you think about it that way, content evolving. The minute we became a digital culture, right, where everyone kind of digital first, where That's it. Alternate. That's an interesting way of saying it. I didn't realize that. Yeah. But it's true, right? Because yeah. your your consumers do juggle the alt storylines and do have room for five Spider Mans and are or you know have a have a more sophisticated kind of content consumption than people have had in the past. Mm -hmm. And you know, and that is certainly true in the game industry. Where and Steve, I've talked to you about this before. Where we have like. 10 year olds are reading build notes about like versions of games, you know, that are being updated every week. And I've had arguments with like pretty intelligent arguments with, with fourth, fifth and sixth graders about like the pricing model for a subscription game versus a DLC game expansion pack and what's a rip off and what's not <laughs> right. Literally with children. That is true. You can ask any child in America their position on loot boxes, for example, or whatever. Like they, and that's a truth. So, like the the way content, like, uh, and that's not just Americans, but like the way we now consume content is professional, and is I think also from the perspective of a creator, because everybody has social media, so they all have a platform, they all have a brand. We definitely saw that in books, we saw a shift 
from people wanting our autograph to sign a book to people wanting a selfie with us because that was the way our brand was helping their brand. Like they could post it and that was like their content. So they used our content to create their content, right? Like, and they were, they now had a different place in this sort of ecosystem of, of, of consuming and telling stories. And it happens all at the same time. And those things do impact each other. So that's a long way of saying, yes, uh, Marvel is a lot like a live service game because you guys are a living, breathing organism in that in the creative uh, council. Think about it that way, and I'm sure also at an executive level when people are planning a product. Because right now, a product is a is a slate. Like a product is a release schedule. It's like how do all these how do these action figures sit with these short, you know, animation. Animated pieces fit with these tentpole movies, fit with these comics, fit with these trades in graphic novels. Like, that's the product, right? And Marvel has, understands that, that people are going to read things in the context of other things and consume things together. And that's what games are like right now. The difference with games is it's just there's less attention to all the other pieces because the focus is really still just on the game. You know, like they don't care as much. There's not, there's really not usually like, in, unless you're Pokemon, right? Who works really like clearly in, you know, the the, Poke, the Pokemon animated uh, TV series came out one year after the release of the first pack of cards. So that's always existed together. But except for that, like games don't really, they have never been able to effectively capitalize on those big narratives. That they build in games. So why is it depressed me so much? Why does it depress me so much to think of our characters as IP? Think of them as worlds. Think I of them as IP worlds. as a service, and I just get sad. Sorry. Okay, that's <laughs> me wearing my other hat, which is like, <laughs> which is how it get because I because when you say IP, you're talking. That's me talking to heads of studios, trying to get them to understand that the most valuable thing they're building is their IP. But you guys understand all that from the get-go. So you don't have to like say that kind of stuff to each other because you you know you're talking about characters and worlds. And you are. And objects. Like, what do, what do people own when they own an intellectual property? They own stuff. They own lightsabers. And they own Alderaan. And they own Luke and Leia and Stormtroopers and Darth Vader. Right? Han Solo. Chewie. Yeah. Like... Like you own faces and places and and weapons essentially. You, to... you, know, you know, Marjorie. So, 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 two things here. <clears throat> Number one, um, I, somebody should have warned you about this. But when you do talk to Steve about this stuff, talk slowly, because you <laughs> know, it 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 like he said, you know, it, it does go over his head. Uh, Thank you. But but yeah, it, 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 it's fascinating to me how how you're talking about how things change on the fly. Because one of the things that that we we discourage tremendously at Marvel is for creators, writers in particular, to change a story midway. I, I I have I've seen it happen twice in my career as editor in chief. Um, both times I, I I warned, don't. It, it was it was just sort of you know writers getting cold feet and changing a story based on you know they they, they have a let's say a six story six issue arc. And the first issue comes out and there's internet feedback coming in saying, oh my God, oh my God, we hate what's going on here. And then them getting cold feet and saying, I'm going to change the ending of my story. And and each time I want to say, don't, just stick to your guns, do what you're doing, it's going to yeah. be fine. Each time it ended up terribly, right? Because because you're not going to please anybody. Stick to your story. Uh, yeah. and, then, and then there was one other time where I had a creator who wanted to change the ending of a story months after it was published in a collected edition because fan feedback to the ending of the story uh, was mm -hmm. not what they wanted. Uh, and that, we just put, we put our foot down and said, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> uh, the story is the story. Um, so it's fascinating to me that, that uh, and, and maybe video games is a different animal in that sense, that, that somewhere in the middle of this game, based on you know some feedback now i understand like if there's technical feedback like hey something's screwing up with the game you gotta fix that right but changing story i mean that, that's a common thing to just say okay we're gonna we're 
scrapping it. We're going instead of right, we're going left. Steve, you look like you had a, something brewing. I was wondering if Joe was going to make some news and start naming names. No, I don't do that. Name and story. Uh, but I, I have seen video games where they've released DLC that did change the end. I want to say they did that with uh, Mass Effect. Yeah, they did. They I don't stuff. know the specifics. But, but you also, but but think about, um, well, Mass Effect's endings were super controversial and there were a bunch of them. But the, um, okay. but, but right now, um, well, all the naughty, so Naughty Dog um, just released, whatchamacallit? Um, Last of Us 2. Last of Us 2, right? And that's a really interesting example of a game that, Narr really narrative driven. It's really, I mean, Naughty Dog people will tell you they're interested in sort of interactive movies in a certain way. Like that's a, that's truly those are narratives that they're like you are getting to play. But I think that um, like they tell a story. The end of Last of Us One was not like how anyone wanted it particularly to end. It was sort of a dark ending. But like they stuck to those guns and really did. That's really like a storytelling first kind of decision making. Um, and that's that's the thing that's changed in games as more sort of expert storytellers have gotten involved. It used to be that that the people who invented game worlds and characters and game stories and wrote, even wrote game dialogue a lot of time were not like trained as writers. It just came, they came from more often from design or it was seen as the fun part of a game director's job. And so like when you, I think there's been a lot of education about how complex, how hard it is to get a story right. And, um, and I think Marvel actually has done a good job. I mean, Marvel creates sort of expert fans, people who consume Marvel comics. And I think partly that's because there are 80 years of it to read and become fluent in and then become expert in. So you have so much fandom expertise. And I think there's like that sort of understanding of like how much thought goes into, you know, each of those products and then the way the products fit together and the way that all your product lines fit together. I think that's, I know that games look to that as an example, like specifically Marvel. What's your favorite video game story? Oh, that's a really good question. I uh, Ms. Pac-Man. No, I uh, I think there are sort of different models. I think that um, I think Destiny, which my friend Jason Jones was the founder of that company and really was like the creative heart of what that universe comes out of, and he is really a world a. a the AAA world builder uh, of a kind of like George R. R. Martin size scope. Um, he really, uh, he set that universe up so that like different, you know, different storylines are more and less successful, but that was a, a very like a deep, rich universe in a certain way. So that's one of my favorite universes. I feel like uh, Last of Us is one of the most, um, successful sort of narrative experiences in a game, I'd say. Yeah. I love, um, I love, um, whatchamacallit, the, um, the robots, uh, the um, Valve. The what? The Valve game, the um, Portal. Oh, Portal. Portal. Yeah, yeah. I helped um, Stanford did a game writing class, and I helped them with the curriculum. And I and I was like, you need to at least have your class watch all the cutscenes on YouTube, Portal Two, because that was another way of like using humor and using like point of view differently. But it's a big it's a big opportunity. The, like game game stories are a huge opportunity because you spend so many hours with those characters that if you can get it right, you are attached to them forever. Mm -hmm. You know, like you yeah. feel like you were those characters. Now, Margie, you, like. you you came back to video games, right? When you talk about Destiny, to do Destiny Two, correct? Yes. So I I worked as a contractor on a million games. Then I had a game developer. I co-founded that. 
then um, which is when which is the first time I worked with Marvel and then uh, we sold we began working with Activision uh, as a company and with them and we had been and then we sold our company they acquired us and um, I said I really had this strong sense that I had never written a novel and I had you know I'd love books going back to my Darkest Rising, um, you know, fan club days. And I uh, really felt like it was a thing I had to do and a story I wanted to tell. And this, or, a, you know, I wanted to be that kind of a storyteller. And then uh, my kids, I have three children. My oldest two daughters were obsessed with Twilight in the era, which drove me crazy. And I was like, um, First of all, this, 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 you know, like, why can't the girl be powerful? And, and why does she, does that character only, you know, everyone else gets to be a vampire and the main character girl only gets to, like, be a fan of a vampire. Because this is before Katniss, Everdeen, and Hunger Games. So uh, I, we set out to write kind of an opposite Twilight. And that just... I wrote it with my daughter's third, my oldest daughter's third grade teacher, who I, Cami Garcia, who I had come to know well, who interestingly now uh, writes comics uh, for DC. I had just finished working on a Harley Quinn uh, and, and a Joker project. But um, she was dark and I was light. That's how that worked out. But uh, the, uh, the, um, we wrote it as friends, basically, uh, because we loved fantasy books, and she taught fantasy book clubs at my house. And then my kids would read them, the pages after I wrote them uh, at night, and uh, that took 12 weeks. And I had no idea how to write a book, but we just sort of did it. And that was sort of the launch of the, of the whole thing. And why, what was the question even? I don't remember. <laughs> well, you were talking about beautiful creatures, which, by the way, was a question that we were going to ask. Um, well, I was asking about, like, you, you know, you, you talked about Destiny 2, about, about Destiny, the, about the video that. game. And you, you actually oh, yeah. you came back. Into, you came back to Destiny. So I got into, so I wrote that book kind of by accident. Um, I wanted to write a book. I didn't understand how that was going to work out. And that book sold instantly. It sold in a large way and it sold to a movie before it had even come out. And it was, you know, Amazon's top, it was on their top 10 books, you know, even for adult books of that year. It was their top teen book, it was 2009. So, um, and I didn't even know there were like best of year lists or anything, like we, were, we had no clue. We hadn't been tracking any of it. So um, that was like a sudden, uh, baptism by fire, you know. So for the next decade, that was what I did, was just sort of keep up with that. Because uh, for YA, a series, you have like a, you have to hit every year, you have to get a book out, you have to sort of serve the series in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And then you want to start sort of doing other things. So I basically just toured and wrote and lived in a YA world, which is super interesting because it's all women. Yeah. At the time, it was mostly women. Uh, and then when that all sort of settled down, that when the series was under control, you know, I started, uh, Sunna reached out, or no, uh, Emily Meehan at Disney Hyperion reached out about Black Widow, and that's when I started working with you guys, which then morphed into actual comics and yep. Captain Marvel. So Marvel. that was my, then, yes, and then that, and then working with Marvel uh, meant I started getting calls again from, you know, people saying, oh, you're back, you're back with heroes, you know, like when you were doing Fantastic Four, are you back in games, which led to more consulting jobs mm -hmm. of me saying, oh, that might be fun again. But really, I ended up at working on Destiny again. Uh, as a favor for a friend. And okay. my brother works as the Call of Duty guy, so I I have always given advice and helped out there. Cool. Well, Mark, 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 because I, I know we're, we're starting to run long, I want to hit on uh, two important things. First of all, your latest novel, uh, Jill and Laurie. 
Um, and you, you, you've written this uh, with Melissa Cruz, uh, Dela Cruz. I'm sorry. Yeah. And uh, so, so tell us about this. I mean, this, this, uh, it's, it's a bit of a. Well, I'm, I'm not gonna go ahead. Tell us about. It. I'll let you let you do the sell. Uh, this is a. You have the graphic, so I, I don't have to hold this. Yeah. Uh, this is a. Uh, it's a retelling. Um, the Greta Gerwig movie came out this year, and uh, similarly, this book and because there was just like I think it was like the 150 year anniversary was that what it was yeah um, and so uh this is a retelling that i particularly love partly because it's kind of fandom me where it's like this was a meaningful book that first showed me uh, a girl being a writer joe mm -hmm. march in the book in the films uh that book has been adapted, by the way, so many times. You can see Katherine Hepburn as Joe March, or you can see the <laughs> Japanese anime series of Little Women. Like it's it's across the board, um, and so uh, so partly it was important because it was literally like what I imprinted on as being a writer. Like I told people I was going to have a, a I was going to go right in a garret overlooking an azure sea in Sardinia. <laughs> Never been in other places. But that was like my plan because Joe March went and wrote up in the garret of her house, had a writing cap, ink stained, ink fingers. And um, it also is about fandom. Joe March is a huge fan of Charles Dickens in the books. They have a club, the Pickwick Papers, which always reminded me of um, the Darkest Rising fan club, right? So like, mm -hmm. It was about like loving books and genre fiction. Joe writes these like Rodrigo and Rodanth, these like, you know, very like high, high, you know, fantastical genre pieces. And uh, that was what I wanted. But, but uh, I also hated the romance in that uh, original book because it was sort of like a, it's a failed, like the writer, Louise Malcott sets up like the perfect you know, love story, and then sort of nukes it, which is fascinating also. So we set out to kind of like examine what would be uh, if we could tell it differently, but also really to look at what it's like to write, uh, to be a writer, writing the story of Little Women. So the short pitch of the book, is, it's like if Joe March was writing the book Little Women about her family, we sort of collapsed uh, the the writer character and the the uh, the writer of the book herself, cool. and it's been interesting. And, and this just came out, correct? Yeah, it came out a week ago. Uh, like you, uh, there were so many important stories going on in the last couple of weeks that we, uh, you know, pulled the plug on a bunch of events and sort of, uh, you know, didn't didn't do much about it. But um, it is out there now. We, we uh, we love it. I uh, I went to grad school before all of my game life in 19th century American literature, so it was really fun to go back and kind of write in the style of Louise May Alcott, which mm. I was miraculously able to do. So this is another kind of full circle project, where yeah. it wasn't me like coming back to games; it was me coming back to like weirdly my school. I went to school with Emily Dickinson's house on my campus. Oh wow. So, so uh, yeah. So so Marge, we're, we're we have a few fan questions. Are are you uh yeah up for it? Just, yeah. just, just okay. We got three quick fan questions. Let's see what we got here. Um, hold on. Let me uh let me find them here. Uh, okay. First question. Oh, uh, this is from Thomas Alwyn. He's a fan. He's 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 always asking uh, great questions. So he's uh, he, he missed he missed the show, um, and he loves our guest. Um, and he's looking forward to the rest of Spider-Man Noir. And the question is, so question, Spider-Man Noir has a very cinematic feel to it. How is it different mm -hmm. writing this comic compared to others you've written and, and compared to novels? That's a great question. I love Spider-Man Noir. It's, uh, it's one of those, it's like Life of Captain Marvel in terms of like, it's a very intentional project that I really wanted to do and really thought a lot about how to, to do it. And the team was all on the same page about it and got excited, which was really busting Spider-Man Noir out of New York and in a more Indiana Jones style, sweeping cinematic 1940s scope 
um, setting him loose on on Europe. And that's been amazing. And I think uh, I think partly because of the era when you're doing something that is a period piece in a certain way, mm-hmm. um, the visual is so important. And then noir is so visual. Yeah. So like, I've been really aware that noir has two great components, right? That make it perfect for a comic. One is it's visual, like it's a, it's like very like incredibly cinematic visual storytelling with like that's striking images, dark and light. But also it's this incredible banter of this sort of like particular kind of like back and forth, fast talking, you know. Um, well, I can't got scratch. See, it's the, got the like that, and that is really for a writer. So yeah. I think it's similarly inspired Juan Ferreira, who is like just incredible, off the hook, like a bizarre genius, and also me because it's fun to write. So um, putting Spidey in that context was was really fun. Uh, and getting to tell a big story with like, you know, London and Berlin and, and you know, heading Istanbul, you know, direction. It, was, mm-hmm. it, it has big adventure stories. So that was super, super fun. Um, but then it was also the thing where every, like, uh, Juan and I got close in terms of the collaboration. It was much closer collaboration than I'd had before, except for maybe like in the sense with you, Joe, where you would be like, no, this moment is here. We started having those kinds of conversations. Mm -hmm. And um, after the first two or first, during the second script, I started trying to let him drive more visually, um, which is not a way I'm used to working. Like I, I call, I usually call out the panels and the shots and uh, I started to see that there was no, like I felt like it was a criminal thing uh, for me to be limiting what he was doing. So I started writing, you know, the Marvel way, like a looser, yeah. and then go back and write, rewriting it, which is like actually more work, but a better effect because this one, I think, really has to be driven by the artist. Right. So I come up with the sort of scenes and, um, and I write a version of the dialogue first and then he conceives you know the layout and how that could go mm. and then i go back and fit you know kind of retrofit and and so you have to be in really close conversation to make that work yeah and we do i love it awesome all right let's you see. Know what that- let's see we got a question uh so bradley has two questions um uh hi margaret uh, love your work on Captain Marvel, especially Life of Captain Marvel. How did you find the inspiration for the plot? Even uh, if given, well, I think we kind of spoke a little bit about that, but if given yeah. the chance to write again, uh, to write it again, would you do it differently? Uh, Life of Captain Marvel, I wouldn't change anything. Yeah. I really love That sounds like a note. What was that? <laughs> that sounds like a subtle note. Right, right. Yeah, you need to change well, something? We could have had, um, we could have had less Steve in the room, for sure. <laughs> uh, no, uh, I wouldn't change anything about that. Uh, if I had to do it over again, I uh, actually, if I had to do it over again, I would have written that at the beginning of my run. I was right. just thinking that that was yeah. that's the one thing is that we landed on it um, think, as you were wrapping up your yeah. run on the regular series. Yeah. yeah. It I think been, that would have been better for me because I would have known, I would have had this sort of, like there's a lot I would have liked to have unpacked from that. But actually, you know, Kelly is doing, an, Kelly Thompson is doing an amazing job and much in the way that um, I built off of everything you did, Steve, as editor and also Kelly Sue DeConnick, who I, is absolutely just like a, a lioness of, women in comics that um kelly's really like used used a lot of um you know gone back to explore a lot of those those things that we built on so that's you know that's part of the marvel thing right is being is being part of something bigger yeah um what where people take it 
But yeah, I wish we'd done that two years ago, you know, yeah. three years right, ago. We, we got one more here from Bradley. Let's see. Um, oh, no, maybe it's the same. Oh, I opened the same question or did I have the same question? Oh, I guess it was the same question. I know he had a, he had a follow up, but I, I, I must have lost it. So uh, my bad. So Margie, so, you know, let's uh, let's bring Steve in myself. Um, what's next? Can you tell us what's next? I mean, you've got your, your new novel out. Um, you, you always, you're always have, working on something. So so what do you want to leave us with? I am finishing. Uh, we're finishing up Spider-Man Noir, which mm -hmm. was briefly paused and is unpaused. So that's super exciting to get to tell the end of that story. Yep. I have uh, a couple unannounced Marvel projects. Um, I'm guessing whatever behind her is next. Right. Something like a little next. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I have a lot of walls, Steve. So there's a bunch. Um, I have another. Uh, so I, I have a. So I have a couple books that will come out eventually. I have. Uh, I'm. All, I'm working on a couple new ideas. Uh, I'm in talks for a show. This or that. You know. Always when you have built up a lot. I've released 15 or 16 books and and you know collections. Mm -hmm. So the stuff of that that's my, you know, my world, those always are in talks for different things. So some of those talks are going on because, you know, we're in a hopping content moment right now. Yeah. But um, my, my Marvel stuff is my favorite. I'm still game consulting. So you will see some of that stuff, too. Awesome. But this is really fun. So thank you for having me. Oh, no, absolutely. It, 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 Margie, you know, again, any, if, if you have any part, parting words for young creators, I'm sure you do. Uh, I always like to close on that with our guests. A any sort of advice, any observations, anything uh, you could leave them with uh, that, you know, they could take home with them. Yeah, I wrote this in uh, the creator letter in the back of the uh, first issue of Life of Captain Marvel. But um, I think I for a shout out to girl girl creators, the hardest thing about a hero's journey when you're a girl is figuring out that you're on a hero's journey and that you're allowed to be on a hero's journey. And it's pretty hard to write about a hero if you can't see yourself as the hero of a story. So I encourage all of you guys to realize you're on a hero's journey because you are. And um, you get to have that. So go have it. And I'd say... Uh, you think your stuff sucks for any creator and uh, suckage is part of the process. It's a process phase. I write something really sucky every day. And if I didn't, then I couldn't be fearless enough to write something that didn't suck. That's my advice is don't be so hard on yourself and realize you're, you are on a hero's journey. You're going to, you're, you're going to nail it guys. That's awesome. Margie, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Uh, you know, we love you. And uh, come back. Come back. And uh, next time, you know, when the next book comes out, when the next project, we'll, we'll, we'll do this again. We're going to talk before that anyway. Um, yeah. so, 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 so thank you, Margie. I'm going to sign off. Steve, it's just, uh, it's going to be you and me for a second here. We're going to, bye, Marge. Um, bye. Sir, thank you. You just, you just blow a kiss to me? No. Yeah, that's, uh, no. Marge is still there. Marge is still there. It's it, it, it. This reminds me. I have a I have a, a friend who whose mother, uh, when she she talks to her mother every day, and her mother, uh, somehow or other, has not learned how to hang up the the iPhone. And every conversation, you know, by mom, and then she hears her mother complaining about her about that conversation, and it's always like, I'm still here, mom. You know, it's a. Uh, that's what that Margie moment reminded me of. Steve, thanks, man. I, yes, I'm actually saying thank you to you. Uh, th th this was this was great. Uh, we knew Margie's great, and uh, and you were okay. So you wanna wanna do this again? Okay. Wanna wanna come on again? Absolutely. All right. All right. Well, I'm gonna say goodbye to you. Stay on the rest of the day. What was that? Let's just stay on the rest of the day. Just you and me. Just let's just sit here and like not say anything. Just just nod knowingly. All right. I'm going to let you go, brother. I'm going to say goodbye to everybody out here. All right. I will. I'm not Bye, blowing you a kiss. Thank you, I'll, Joe. I'll talk to you later. Yep. See you then. Hey, gang. Uh, so there you go. Margie Stoll. And uh, I hope you guys had fun with that. Uh, and yes. Ready? 
I'm going to tell you who's next. I'm going to tell you who's next. I got my fingers crossed. I've got a confirmation from him. Um, Christopher Priest. I finally got him. I finally got Christopher Priest. So, uh, so Priest has agreed to come on. We're going to be back in a week on Monday again, hopefully same time, same channel. Um, and uh, again, I, I, I hope this happens. I hope it does. Uh, but I think it will. I really think it will. It's going to be a great, great interview. He and I go back a long, long way. He's the guy that discovered me and got me into comics. And also the guy who recreated the Black Panther uh, over the Marvel Knights imprint. So we got a lot to talk about. So, so come back next week and, and we'll do that. Uh, as always, we will be continued to be continued. Uh, love you guys. Uh, stay safe. Stay healthy. And I'll see you in the funny bugs. Funny